I'm Dr. Larry Dean, the director of the University of Washington Regional Heart Center. I'd like to welcome all of you to our Heart Center Grand Rounds this morning. It's a pleasure for me to introduce our first uh, speaker, Dr. Chris King, who's recently joined our faculty at the University of Washington School of Medicine as an assistant professor in the Department of Surgery. Dr. King. Good morning, and thank you, Dr. Dean. Today we'd like to talk about uh, treatment, especially uh, surgical therapy of the ascending aortic aneurysm and dissection and in special regards uh, with the uh, Marfan's population. I'd like to initiate the discussion of this topic by first presenting a case of a 45-year-old male who had a long-known history of Marfan syndrome and aortic root dilatation. This was followed by serial CT scans over several years, and three months prior to his presentation to our facility, he had a, a measurement of 4.8 centimeters in diameter of his aortic root. Three months uh, prior, he uh, was doing well, and then uh, one week prior to coming to our attention at the hospital, he had a complaint of chest and back pain, which had become acutely worse in the 24 hours prior to his uh, admission to our facility. Uh, this was associated with an increase of his aortic root in dimension from 4.8 centimeters to 5.5 centimeters in diameter, and now there was an associated aortic dissection. Other significant past medical history for this gentleman included uh, mitral valve prolapse, which was associated with his Marfan syndrome. He had a history of hypertension, peptic ulcer disease, medullary sponge disease of his kidneys, astigmatism, and elevated HDL. Medications at the time of admission included metoprolol, a beta blocker aimed at reducing uh, his hypertension. He took an aspirin a day and niacin. Past surgical history only included appendectomy, he also had a significant family history of Marfan syndrome and prior aortic dissection in family members. His physical exam was largely unremarkable. His vital signs were stable. His carotid arteries had bilateral soft breweries, which were related to his new onset of aortic insufficiency related to his aortic dissection. His lungs were clear to auscultation. His heart had both a systolic and diastolic murmur, but otherwise a regular rate and rhythm. His abdomen was benign. His extremities had preserved pulses and, and movement and sensation. Uh, however, his pulses were somewhat weakened. Neurologically, he was grossly intact and non-focal and hadn't suffered a stroke or transient ischemic event at this time. Laboratory abnormalities included a low platelet count of 71,000. His coagulation profile was slightly elevated with a prothrombin time of 17.3. His kidney function was mildly impaired with a creatinine of 1.4. This is a, a schematic diagram of an aortic dissection. On the far left, we have a very muscular looking artery or the aorta. It has three layers. The innermost layer would be the intima. The middle layer would be the media or the muscular layer of the artery. And the outermost layer would be the adventitia or the connective tissue of this artery. In the middle picture, you can see a dissection flap developing, and what has happened is the blood has been forced through the intima, creating a tear, usually related to a hypertensive crisis or increase in blood pressure. This tear is then propagated into the media, and then the aorta peels apart much like an onion, forming two layers. The third picture shows what happens as far as the formation of a true and false lumen. Blood flow is then divided in an unequal fashion through these two lumens, depending on the various amounts that they contribute to the uh, area or the orifice of, of the uh, aorta. The complications arise then when these uh, blood flow is directed away from the end artery organs such as the kidney, the brain, the liver, the intestine, or the uh, extremities. And that's why we intervene when this uh, occurs. This is his uh, CT scan at time of presentation. You can see the dissection flap easily in the ascending and descending aorta. 
These are, again, more three-dimensional reconstructions of the aortic dissection. Right here is the left ventricle of the heart. This is the aortic root. You can see it's, it's somewhat enlarged. Right there is the dissection flap going up through the root into the arch. And again, this is the continuation of that flap in the descending portion of the thoracic aorta. Uh, this is the intraoperative uh, transesophageal echocardiogram performed by Dr. Donald Oxhorn, who's a member of the anesthesiology department here at the University of Washington. We have a cross-sectional shot of the aortic valve. And the color flow here, in special regards, this green plume right here, represents the corresponding aortic insufficiency uh, due to the dissection and its effects on the commissures of the aortic valve, rendering it incompetent. This image is a non-color flow version of a same uh, transesophageal echocardiogram performed during the operation. As you can see here, the aortic valve and annulus are somewhat diminished or smaller than the enlarged aortic root. And on the very uh, edge of the frame, which you may or may not be able to tell, is the initiation of the dissection flap. At this time, I'd like to turn over the discussion and uh, continuing uh, discussion of the Marfan's uh, syndrome and uh, problems with regarding to aortic aneurysms and dissections to uh, Dr. Peter Byers, who's a professor of pathology and medicine here at the University of Washington. And uh, he will uh, further add to the conversation, Dr. Byers. Thank you, Dr. King. Uh, Marfan syndrome is a relatively uncommon disorder, uh, but every time we first make the diagnosis after an aortic dissection, we uh, are disturbed. In this case, obviously, uh, this was a gentleman in whom the diagnosis is, had been made prior to dissection, but it's not uncommon for the diagnosis to be made following a dissection. We always wonder at that time, why was the diagnosis not recognized earlier? what features of the patient or the family contributed to the apparently late diagnosis. Now, Marfan syndrome is a dominantly inherited genetic condition, which means that it occurs in multiple generations. Although about 20 to 30 percent of people with, who have Marfan syndrome uh, have it as a result of a new mutation in the fibrillin-1 gene. Um, the frequency in the population is about 1 in 15,000, although the Marf National Marfan Foundation uh, often estimates it, it to be a little bit more frequent than that. Um, one of the very marked things, and I think one of the things that really does contribute to late diagnosis often, is the variable expression of clinical features, so that not all of the major features that we expect uh, are present. Uh, the features that we rely on to make the diagnosis include a family history of Marfan syndrome, or a complication compatible with Marfan syndrome. So if a diagnosis has not been made, aortic dissection in a family is a very strong indication that this is something to be uh, thought about. Uh, people are often tall for their families, uh, have arachnodactyly, which means long, thin fingers, uh, long, thin feet, pectus deformities, so they may have pectus carinatum, that is a scooped out chest, or pectus um, uh, is, uh, uh, carinatum is a pigeon-shaped uh, chest, or pectus excavatum, which is a scooped out chest, scoliosis, and a high arched palate. Uh, the other uh, very important diagnostic features include an aortic aneurysm, and mitral valve prolapse is usually part of that. Lens dislocation is extremely important because it's very rare in the general population, uh, and about 70 to 80 percent of people with uh, Marfan syndrome have lens dislocation. And in order to make the diagnosis, we usually require that two or more of these features uh, is present uh, in the individual. Uh, the clinical picture is often very variable. And some of these features, uh, tall stature, uh, mitral valve prolapse, um, are in, uh, common in the general population. And it really is the syndromic nature, the syndromic aspect of things that's important. And it's often important uh, that people with this be referred to a specialist. Um, being a medical geneticist, we often think that it's a medical geneticist who's important. But anybody who is familiar with the features of Marfan syndrome is uh, an appropriate uh, uh, point uh, for referral, and often in a multidisciplinary setting. The early diagnosis of Marfan syndrome is important for several reasons. And first is assessment of the aortic root size. Uh, the second is that treatment with beta blockers may delay a late uh, aortic enlargement. The third is that we think it's important to reduce or to remove uh, affected children and uh, adolescents uh, 
from uh, high impact uh, sport activities. Uh, it's not uncommon for these kids to be involved in uh, playing basketball or sometimes playing football because they're b often big kids. And we think it's important to remove them because we think that uh, uh, exercise to those limits uh, may increase the risk of aortic dissection and increase the rate at which the aorta grows. It's important to assess the ocular status to ensure good vision and to make sure that educational opportunities are followed up. Evaluation and treatment of scoliosis uh, may be necessary and surgical intervention may be necessary. And one of the things that's really quite important is that the diagnosis of a child in a family may identify other people who are asymptomatic at the, that point or who have not been diagnosed but are at risk for aortic dissection um, and, and the, the problems that ensue from that. Um, I'd like now to turn uh, the, uh, the program over to uh, Dr. Gabriel Aldea, who is a professor in the Division of Cardiac Surgery, uh, who can talk about the cardiovascular cardiac uh, surgery approach to people with Marfan syndrome and other uh, aneurysms. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Byers. So at this point, we have a patient with an aortic dissection, and I wanted to, before getting uh, into a discussion of the technical aspects of how we manage uh, the aortic dissection, is to talk a little bit about its surgical considerations. The most important aspect that we have to deal with early on is an accurate diagnosis, and specifically, we're trying to disassociate in a patient with an aortic dissection whether or not there is aneurysmal involvement of the aorta, and here we need the uh, help of our uh, cardiothoracic anesthesia colleagues, Dr. Bodel, Dr. Oxor in the operating room. And but we're using transesophageal echocardiography. We specifically want to know the exact location of the tear. Uh, typically, as I will show you in a moment, this is within a very proximal two centimeters of the aorta. We also want to know the proximal and distal extent of the aneurysm and or dissection. We want to establish whether or not there is end organ ischemia, as uh, Dr. King is. Uh, talked about before, uh, blood in a false lumen would shear off the circulation for some end organs. We want to uh, uh, see and determine whether or not there is associated aortic arch pathology, and I will show you some uh, slides uh, looking at this and the approaches to aortic uh, arch pathology. That will change our surgical technique to include deep hyperthermic circulatory rest to deal with the aortic arch. We want to very carefully, in all patients with aortic dissection, evaluate the aortic annulus, the valve, and the sinuses, uh, particularly in young patients, to make sure, in fact, that this is not associated with a connective tissue disorder, such as uh, Marfan syndrome or annular aortic actasia. And finally, uh, we always try to consider whether or not, in these patients with aortic dissection, uh, repair of the aortic valve is possible. So, uh, again, when we approach a patient like this, this is a, a, uh, an intraoperative image of a patient uh, with a full sternotomy, so the head vessels are up here and uh, the uh, uh, feet of the patients are over here, and you see a very large hematoma sitting on top of the heart. It's very important to remember that, again, before we even open the chest, we have to have access to the femoral vessels so we can uh, safely place the patient on cardiopulmonary bypass, and more importantly, again, with the help of our cardiothoracic anesthesia colleagues to make sure that when we cannulate an established bypass that in fact the femoral aortic cannula is in a true lumen. The initial goals of the surgical approach is to avoid a proximal tear. It is the tear involving the heart itself that usually causes the patient's early death and this can be associated either with a free rupture of the aneurysm itself, with a pericardial tamponade, with acute decompensated aortic insufficiency or with uh, blood in a false lumen shearing one of the coronaries and causing coronary ischemia. So again, even before opening the pericardium, we have to be able to pet, put the patient on bypass to be able to very uh, quickly deal with these issues if they do in fact develop. So this is the um, uh, intraoperative photograph of the, this particular patient. You see again that the patient's head would be situated over here, uh, the patient's feet over there. You see the uh, uh, heart of the patient, the right ventricular outflow tract, a very massively dilated ascending aorta, and you see a blood-tinged tinged subadventitia, blood in the, in the wrong layer of the heart, only one cell layer away from actually rupturing, and you see a thinning or narrowing of the uh, aneurysm in this patient uh, at the level of the head vessels, which will be coming off over here. So this is a, uh, an aortic dissection in the presence of an aneurysm in a patient with Marfan's. Uh, 
Now again, just uh, remembering the pathology, typically in most patients with aortic dissection, the tear in aorta would be uh, roughly within a first proximal two or three centimeters uh, above the aortic valve. You see the native aortic valve leaflets over here in a, in a gross pathological specimen, the ostium of the left main coronary artery, and typically about a centimeter above the ostium of the left main coronary artery, you see a tear in the uh, intima. And in this picture, probably at the level of approximately at this level here, two or three centimeters above, you see a compressed native aorta by a large external hematoma. If we look at this microscopically, we see a disruption in the endothelium and intima. Uh, again, you see the area of rupture over here, and you see blood uh, tinging uh, the, and going through the media and is only being held together by a single layer of fibroblasts, which is the adventitia. Now, as you can imagine, if blood is uh, 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 coursing in the wrong lumen, here's the true lumen. In this particular case, the carotid, you see compression by a hematoma. You, would, uh, you can create distal organ is ischemia and compression. Uh, and in fact, some patients present with aortic dissection with neurological deficits because of this. Or uh, again, an example of a thoracic aorta where this is the true lumen and this is the false lumen. The true lumen can be compressed and this can present with visceral ischemia. Uh, insufficient blood supply to the kidneys, to the abdominal organs, or to the legs, which can be a significant problem. Now, in most uh, patients, the goal of the surgery, uh, again, is to remove the tear and remove the uh, area which is originating uh, the false dissection of blood within the wall of the aorta. And we do this by, after removing the tear and removing the aorta by reconstituting all the layers of the aorta, in this case with an inner and our outer felt suture, and again, treating the prolapsed aortic valve with a suture and resuspending the aortic valve. So in a typical aortic dissection uh, case where um, the sinuses are not involved, uh, all we would need to do is reconstitute the proximal aortic walls, resuspend the valve, and do a similar procedure on a distal ascending aorta, uh, again, reconstituting all the layers of the aorta, and substitute for the uh, pathological dissected aorta a tube graft that is uh, made out of Dacron. Uh, more recently, we're able to constitute the uh, layers of the aorta with biological materials called bioglue materials, which are allowing us to essentially uh, make this procedure much, much faster by gluing the abnormal walls of the uh, uh, proximal and distal aortas together, and again, substituting a tube graft to reconstitute the aorta. If there is pathology that is involving the aortic arch, this becomes a much more complicated procedure, and in fact, that cannot be ignored and need to be dealt with at the same time. So typically, for example, this would be a situation of an aneurysm that is involving the arch of the aorta as well as the ascending aorta. And in those patients, we will need to cool the patient to a very low temperature, about 15 to 80 degrees centigrade. And under conditions of deep hypothermic circulatory arrest, when we know the brain is protected, we can actually stop all circulation to the body for brief, period of, of, uh, brief periods of time of about 30 to 45 minutes. At that point, we need to reconstitute the entire arch of the aorta. So how do we do that? We would telescope a graft onto itself and push it into the descending thoracic aorta and sew, an, sew it onto the descending thoracic aorta. Then by pulling a string that is attached to the distal aspect of the graft, bring this graft over, um, leaving a, a small flange of graft left behind. And I will explain why this is necessary in a moment. At that point, we will reattach all the head vessels, the innominate, the subclavian, the left carotid, as a patch, and then re restart antegrade perfusion at that point, and then deal with the proximal aorta. Now, the reason why we leave a segment of um, a graft material beyond the left subclavian is that in case we need to deal with, with pathology in the future, it will not be necessary to, again, reconstitute and reinstitute circulatory rest but rather we can just through a left chest incision reach over for this graft, just put a clamp over here and be able to sew a new graft to the remaining of the prosthetic material, essentially eliminating all the native aorta. Now in Marfan syndrome, we, we uh, are very keen and aware that we cannot just substitute a tube graft in the ascending aorta. And the reason is even in the presence of aneurysmal disease, and especially in the presence of aortic dissection, 
the sinuses are very heavily involved and the walls of the aorta are not normal. Just to uh, again uh, uh, exemplify this, this is microscopic slides of a normal aorta showing uh, elastic lamina and interspersed smooth muscle cells. And we see that in the presence of Marfan's, there is a loss of elastic lamella and uh, proteoglycan deposition, which makes the wall of the aorta quite weak. Uh, this was termed in the past medial degeneration or cystic medial necrosis. And its relative weakness of the wall of the aorta, uh, if left behind, can eventually cause problems in the future. This is a typical example of a patient in which this has occurred. So this is a man who, at the age of 26, presented with an aortic dissection, and at that point had a, uh, a tube graft placed in the ascending aorta of, of Dacron. The aortic valve was resuspended, the sinuses were spared, and at that point there was not a lot of thought given to the fact that this may be associated with connective tissue disorder. Twenty years later, the patient presents to us with a su sudden syncopal episode, and in a process of evaluating him, we, we get the following CAT scan. You see the tube graft of the aorta over here. This is the ascending aorta. This would be the superior vena cava and the pulmonary artery with contrast. And you see a large pseudoaneurysm, a weakness of the aorta with blood in the wrong layer um, ab above or at the level of the graft itself. Now, how do we do this? The way we typically deal with an aneurysm or dissection of the aorta that involves in pathology that involves the sinuses, such as in some uh, patient with, with Marfan syndrome, we have to excise the entire aorta. We typically would excise the valve and the sinuses of the aorta and implant a valve conduit, a tube graft with a prosthetic valve at the end and sew it onto the annulus. We then mobilize the right and left main coronary arteries and reimplant the left and right cor main coronary arteries to this graft and finally sew the distal aspect of the graft to the distal ascending aorta just proximal to the head vessels. Uh, typically the mobilization of the coronaries uh, is quite easy in patients with connective tissue disorders. The mobilization of the right coronary uh, artery is sometimes more limited by the presence of a conal branch and that needs to be done very carefully. And very proper orientation of the coronary arteries to prevent torsion or tension is very, very critical in these patients. However, if we're presented with a uh, um, a situation that is done under more elective circumstances, valve sparing procedures should be uh, very much thought about and undertaken. Before we do this, we need to kind of understand the normal anatomy of the valve, and as we do this, we assess this in the operating room, and there's some relational anatomies that we need to understand. So this would be one of the coronary cusps, and we look at the uh, free margin versus the base of the, of the valve, and typically the ratio of this would be 1.5 to 1 of the base versus the free margin. When there's a lot of pathology in aortic dilatation, the free margin would elongate, and therefore the uh, opposition of uh, the leaflets against each other and competency would be significantly diminished. So we visually inspect the valve before we attempt to repair it to make sure that it's intact. In addition to it, we need to understand the relational anatomy of the sinotubular junction and the aortic annulus. Typically, the aortic annulus is about 10 to 15 percent larger in diameter than the sinotubular junction. So we have to reconstitute the same anatomy when we re-implant the native valve. If the sinotubular junction is too wide, it would lead to lack of co-outpatient centrally uh, and uh, aortic insufficiency, which is one of the mechanisms of failure. In addition to it, if the annulus itself, the aortic annulus, enlarges, it progressively enlarges, that too would end up with a mode of failure. So both the sinotubular junction has to be secured and prevented from further dilatation, as is the aortic annulus. Now again, to remember the relational anatomy of the aortic valve uh, and the mitral valve, again, uh, remember that connective tissue disorders and annular aortic actasia is a disease of the fibrous component of the annulus. 55% uh, to 60% of the annulus from the, essentially the left coronary sinus of main coronary artery to the right main coronary artery, particularly involving the non-coronary cuspus fibrous, the remaining of the aortic annulus um, is muscular. And this fibrous component of the non-coronary cusp continues on to the fibrous component uh, with the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve, which we often are able to repair, and which can also be involved with connective tissue disorders. So again, when we deal with this, we understand that there will be a predominant dilatation of the non-coronary cusp because of the, uh, the compromise of the fibrous component uh, 
of the uh, aortic annulus. And so therefore, if the valve is preserved, one has to perform an annuloplasty, a reduction when embracing this with a, a portion of, uh, of uh, a Dacron, either completely circumferentially, as is our practice, or as is demonstrated here by Dr. Tyrone David, one of the champions of this procedure, ex extending from one coronary ar artery all the way to the other and encompassing the entire non-coronary uh, leaflet. So how do we preserve the aortic valve? Again, this was championed by Drs. Yacoub from England and Dr. Tyrone David from Toronto. The intention is then to replace and excise the uh, abnormal sinuses, uh, and then we essentially uh, uh, leave only three to five millimeters of native aortic valve in place and excise all the sinuses. We can then implant a tube graft um, all the way onto the annulus and then sew the uh, patient's own aortic valve within the tube graft and then reimplant the coronary arteries. The, um, Indications for surgical intervention for uh, uh, thoracic aortic aneurysms, for ascending aortic aneurysm, uh, has changed, and especially it has particularly changed in the presence with Marfan syndrome. In the past, uh, we have uh, specifically in, in patients who are older with atherosclerotic aneurysms, the benchmark to decide to operate on an ascending aorta is when the uh, aorta is enlarged beyond 1.5 times the size of the normal dimensions of the remaining of the aorta. Um, the uh, aortic dimensions that are not ac are now acceptable for repair have decreased as our surgical techniques for managing of uh, aortic surgery have improved. So again, at this point, in a patient with Marfan syndrome, the recommendation is that any aorta over 50 millimeters should be operated on electively. Um, in uh, an aorta of greater than 45 millimeters in patients with a, pr a family history of dissection or in which a uh, life val uh, a val valve sparing procedure uh, has been performed, or in a patient in which other parts of the aorta have already shown dilatation as well. Again, this is also extended uh, to uh, uh, women uh, who desire pregnancy. We know that pregnancy can, again, predispose to acute dilatation of the aorta and dissection. Again, when to operate, we must avoid the morbidity of emergent replacement of a torn aorta. The mortality of an emergency intervention on the, on the aorta across the country is about 12.5%, with a morbidity of, of about 50%, primarily related, as Dr. Byers and Dr. King pointed out earlier, to the acute ischemic events related to uh, a misplaced circulation. And in, instead of that, replace those with uh, uh, um, elective replacement, where the mortality is on the order of 1.5%, and major complications are, are in the order of 5%. So with those kind of approaches, we uh, believe that, again, as uh, emphasized before, uh, Marfan survival has significantly improved, again, from a mean age of roughly four, 40 years of age in the 1960s. And this is approaching, not qu quite reaching, the normal population. It's well over the age of 60 uh, in the current uh, era of very careful follow-up and very uh, uh, aggressive early surgical intervention. We believe that valve preservation is extremely uh, effective in experienced hands, particularly when surgery is done under elective circumstances uh, in the absence of an acute aortic dissection. And most important is the careful follow-up of that individual patient because the rest of their aorta is still prone to uh, pathology, aneurysmal dilatation and dissection, and uh, the uh, patient's family um, by an experienced multidisciplinary team. Uh, I thank you for your attention. Well, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Alde and the other speakers for their excellent presentations and the audience participation. I look forward to seeing all of you at another ra Grand Rounds in the near future. Thank you.